Okay, everyone. So as promised, we'll, we'll have a, a, a panel um, conversation to sort of pick up on some of these topics that we're, we're talking about, uh, both around how um, new technologies are dramatically changing the way that we're making music, the way that we're consuming music, the way that we're able to track the music that's being consumed, the way that we're able to drive um, monies to, to creators. Um, but also, hopefully, we can talk about the possibilities that exist ahead of us. I think for too many years, the industry was focusing on the challenges. I'm more interested in all the um, exciting possibilities that lie ahead of us. So um, I'll start by asking every panelist to quickly introduce themselves in uh, about a minute or less, and then we'll, we'll take it from, uh, from there. So uh, Christoph, you want to kick it off? And uh, I, will personal, I personally want to thank Christoph because Sasem was actually the first performing rights society that joined open music and has been a big supporter from, from the beginning. And in my view, you, along with Deosto, are some of the more progressive rights societies. So I'll, uh, we'll, start, we'll start with you. Thank you, Panos. Uh, so I'm Christophe Vignier, uh, Head of Resources and Strategy at SASEM. So of course, SASEM is, uh, you know, uh, was created in 1851, so it's a long time ago. And of course, we are, uh, you know, we are defending uh, author rights, uh, representing our members. So and basically, what we do today is. Uh, almost what, was what, you know, what we did 150 years ago. It's all about the same thing. Uh, but of course, the, use, the evolution of usages makes our work pretty different. Today, we have 165,000 members. We have uh, 1.4 billions of sales revenue. We are distributing uh, money to more than two million works. So, you know, it has become an industry uh, and and we have to cope with the challenge uh, of digital. And this is what I'm going to talk, uh, I think, a little bit later. So uh, here is what is Sasem and who I am. Hello, Barcelona. Uh, my name is Turo. Uh, I'm the innovation guy at Teosto. Teosto is the Collective Management Society in Finland. We are representing 30,000 music creators in Finland. Um, we are not as big as SASEM, but we are definitely the coolest CMO in the world <laughs> and one of the most forward-thinking organizations in our domain. Hi, I'm Richie Houghton. I'm a artist whose creativity has been unlocked by technology, so music technology has always been kind of key to my excitement and inspiration. And uh, I've been involved in a number of technologies uh, that try to promote transparency um, and also try to create more efficiencies in, um, in, in licensing, um, you know, especially after trying to release a number of mix compilations in the early 2000s, which had over six or 700 tracks in 60 minutes. And some of the rights agencies told me that the amount of royalties I needed to pay were more than I would have made per CD. It just seemed, it didn't make sense. And that kind of uh, got my ideas and inspiration started. Hello, my name is Nacho Garcia Vega. I'm a Spanish uh, musician and composer, uh, president at the International Artists Organization, which is the uh, umbrella organization gathering 10 national uh, coalitions of performers, um, 10 countries uh, f across Europe. Uh, some of my colleagues are here, Suzanne Combo from France, uh, Florent Le Duc, uh, Aya Brahm from Belgium, uh, Thomas Gisselman from uh, Denmark. We represent uh, artists, on, uh, we speak on behalf of artists from these countries, and we protect the rights and the interests of, uh, of, our, of our family of uh, performers. Hi, everyone. So my name is Jaco Lopez, and I run digital operations at Bitmat. Uh, Bimat is a music technology company that was founded 11, 11 years ago in, in Barcelona. And we basically offer music monitoring services for stakeholders in the music industry, uh, mainly collective management organizations like Sase Manteosto, but also publishers and artists. And our goal is uh, to track music wherever it's being played so that artists can get uh, remunerated as they deserve. And I would say as Teosto, we are pretty cool as well. 
Hi there, uh, Peter Harris, and with Resonate, which is a streaming music cooperative, meaning that it's owned by the members, the fans, the artists, the labels are all co-owners. And we're experimenting with a new listening model called Stream to Own, which is pay as you go, and is all designed around the issues of fair royalty payments and fair collections and all that. And so we're using blockchain tech in a number of areas to, um, to, to track that and report that. And so very excited to, for the discussion today. So I'll, um, I'm hoping that we're going to have more of a, a, a casual conversation here on stage. Um, but certainly, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, approach as open music is to be a coordinator, not necessarily a dictator when it comes to what happens where. So open standards similar to TCP IP that unlocked innovation on the internet. And you could never predict 30 years ago that things like Uber or Netflix would come about. Our view is the same. So I, I want to turn to the panel from your own individual areas and, and ask you, what are the interesting uh, sort of new avenues that are opening up because of these changes that are happening around us? We talked about technologies like AI and VR, but I don't want necessarily, or blockchain, I don't want to limit it to that space. Um, so I'm keen for for you to talk about your respective area and how you think these changes are affecting you. Christoph, you want to kick it off? Uh, yes, what, what I think uh, the, the big change for us, uh, so of course, we started to introduce uh, digital almost 20 years ago. You know, the digital revolution in the music industry started in the second half of the 90s. And of course, now we have uh, some kind of maturity in this process. What has been uh, really um, um, important is the massifications uh, of all the data that we have to process. You know, uh, think about uh, the time where we were selling a record. You, you, when you sell a record and an album, you, you just get a percentage of the album, and you have the, uh, the information once, and then after it's finished. You know, you don't have to process anymore. You distribute the money, and it's, it's, it's finished. What do we do now? Then there had been a, a, a period where uh, iTunes have introduced uh, uh, something around uh, uh, you know, sing singles, it's not anymore an album, but it's tracks. Uh, then you have to multiply the information by 15, almost 15 tracks in an album. And then now we are into the streaming world where you have any time somebody is streaming a song, we have the information. We need to process, we need to claim rights, and we need to distribute for that specific stream. And if to be very, very clear about what it means, you know, at the same, for example, we receive every month from Spotify. Let's take an example of a sales report uh, coming from Finland for the month of February. There is a line like uh, Rihanna for diamonds for the month of February. Uh, we had uh, for the, um, um, the price model at 999, uh, 1,352 stream for a sales revenue of X, that is a line of reporting. Last year, we have been processing 6 billion lines, okay, like this, um, in 130 different countries uh, for all the DSPs. Uh, the, the, the year before, it was only 3 billion lines, and the year before was one. So one, three, six billion, uh, so almost double every year, while the market and the value is uh, growing by 30%. So this is a big challenge, you know, you have to, if you want to do your job, which is to claim for rights and to distribute the money, you have to cope with uh, the, the, you know, the, the volume of data doubling every year for 30% of growth in value. So which means that the transaction is getting smaller and smaller. So of course, how can you do that? Uh, we were used to do it with media, with people. With, uh, uh, it, was it was not automatic processes. We were sometimes using Excel. But that, that was you know, just what we were doing. Now, if we want to cope with this world, we have to invest in big data. We have to refine completely our um, uh, technology strategy. This is why SSM have, have been uh, signing a big uh, deal with uh, IBM. 
so that we, you know, we have uh, all the technology infrastructure um, based on big data technology to make sure that we have the scalability that we allow us to process all the data that we have to, uh, you know, to, to deal with. Uh, because if we don't process the data, we, we can't claim for the rights. And of course, if we can't claim for the rights, we can't distribute. So that was really important to, to have, let's say, the, a baseline of technology which ensure scalability. Then, then of course, it's not just about uh, um, big data technology. On the top of that, you need to have machine to, for uh, identification, uh, you know, and you have to automatize identification of this is Rihanna, this is the song Diamonds, I recognize it, and I can calculate the rights and the claims that are related to that song for this specific country. You need to have machines, and this is where it makes sense to, to think about machine learning, to think about cognitive intelligence, and that's also why we've been doing this deal with uh, IBM, to make sure that we can massify identification process and, uh, and, uh, uh, and claim processes, because that's the key of our future, cope with the, with the volume of data. And of course, to, to, to do, to feed the, ma the, the machine learning systems and the cognitive intelligence, you need metadata. And also why we also work with uh, BIMAT. Uh, we know we need fingerprints, we need documentation, si we need uh, documentation systems, we need information about recordings, so that you know, intelligent smart engines can uh, do properly the job uh, of identification and claiming. So, so hopefully, these new technologies are able to hopefully drive costs down, right, for societies, which means increased money for, for creators, but then also enable us to um, collect or identify usage of music in ways that in the past was pretty, pretty difficult. So um, uh, both uh, Turo and Jacque, can you talk a bit about, uh, about these uh, areas from your respective side? Maybe I'll start quickly with you, and then I'll go to, uh, to Turo. Sure, so in line with what Christophe was saying, I mean, the way we see it is that technology is, uh, is changing the industry um, and it's bringing uh, lots of opportunities, but it's at the same time becoming a challenge. You know, if you go back 40 years ago um, and you have uh, what kind, how music was played, and you see that probably there were two, three, four public radio broad um, stations being, doing broadcast, and if you see it from a collective management perspective, you could see how maybe by having two, three, five people listening to that music. It was enough to track how that music was being played and then allocating those uh, monies that were collected to the, to the right holders that the... Because this was based on sampling, exactly. not tracking. Or it could even be tracking, but the volumes were that you have four radio stations playing not even 24 seven, so it was feasible to do it by humans. Um, if you jump from uh, two years ago, no, you have now streaming services in which uh, as Christophe was saying, are, are generating billions of transactions. Uh, so you need to, the same way that technology is evolving, you need to cope with technology as well to be able to monitor and to track and to be efficient. Uh, something that you said, to be cost effective, not only to be able to handle and to work with big societies like, like SSM, but also other smaller players that are still uh, have right owners that they deserve a right representation. So either you are able to use this technology in a wise way um, to offer cost effective solutions and otherwise, there, there's going to be a lot of stakeholders in the industry that are not going to be able to pay their bills because they don't have the means to keep up with the technology evolutions as, as they will need to collect the royalties that they, they deserve. And even though many people, I think, have traditionally criticized the music industry as being a laggard in technology, the truth is we're actually one of the first industries in the media space to be successfully evolving into this new model uh, just quickly, I, I want to get to Turo, and then I'll, I'll go back to you, Christoph. Yeah, uh, I feel the same way that the whole digitalization of music consumption and uh, rights management forces us to change, and we have to change fast in order to stay relevant and create value for our owners, the music creators. Uh, I had a pleasure to work with Peter a year ago at Music Tech Fest Blockchain Lab, and I remember uh, telling at that time that, from my point of view, I, I don't believe that the first uh, real blockchain implementations for music industry w will be uh, topics like uh, a new GRD or mm -hmm. 
smart contract licensing platforms because it will take some time, but but I, but I guess the, the first useful solutions will be smaller, something that will improve the current industry, and that's exactly what we have been doing at Teosto uh, with the launch of Pigeon blockchain platform a couple of weeks ago. So we, this word is being thrown around blockchain, um, and I know Marco talked about it a very little, I talked about it even littler, uh, but Peter, do you want to quickly talk to people about why this technology is exciting? I, it, it, Marco talked about it with respect to its applicability on digital currency, um, but I think us in the music industry and the SSM and Teosto are pretty active in the space, are excited about its other possible applications. You're one of the leaders. You want to very quickly summarize what it is and what, what's yeah. exciting? Um, so everyone's heard of like HTTP and SMTP. These are and if you haven't, you use it every single day. You use them all the time. Um, they're protocols. And so what's going on in the blockchain space is that whole new protocols are being developed for moving information around. And it's a, I, I think in many ways, a more profound development than the internet itself, which is, can sound like hyperbole in some ways, in some contexts, but um, being immersed in this the last three years, I'm convinced that that's true in ways that even I didn't anticipate, and a lot, of, most of us didn't. It's developing so fast that it's almost impossible to keep up. So, blockchain 101. Uh, everyone knows about Bitcoin, right? Everybody's heard of what Bitcoin. Every, who who knows about Bitcoin? Show of hands. Okay. Oh, wow. So it's impressive. It's pretty common knowledge, right? So. Basically, Bitcoin is a digital currency that works because you have transactions that are written in blocks, they're sequential in order, and they cannot be changed. They cannot be overwritten. And it's dis decentralized and distributed in a way that you would have to hack 51% of the computers processing the Bitcoin blockchain simultaneously, which is not something even the NSA can do, in order to change the records. And so that's why you have a currency that, that works, and you can transfer money back and forth and it's rock solid. It can't, it can't be hacked. It's hack-proof. So that's kind of blockchain 1.0. Blockchain 2.0 came online in the last couple of years. It uh, started in the summer of 2014, and that's called Ethereum. And it's that same general concept of sequential blocks that are being written, but the thing that they did that was monumental was to add software and smart contracts into that system. And so. Uh, many people describe Ethereum as being uh, the, the workings of a global world computer. And this is where we're, gonna, we're, we're starting to see some of the incredibly fast innovation taking place and where a lot of these rights mm -hmm. um, kind of issues will be processed. Of course, it's not the only system that's going on. There's, there's other blockchains and IoT, and there's other service providers doing other specific niche um, examples, like BigchainDB was mentioned earlier. Yeah. So just real quick, because then I want to turn it over to Nacho and, 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 and Richie. Um, on the two performing rights society representatives that we have here, what's exciting about blockchain when it comes to your ability to track and collect and distribute money to creators that you, you represent? Maybe I'll start with Christoph and then quickly. Yeah. You know, uh, when we, I, I have to thank Vanos and uh, Berkeley College to introduce me the blockchain technology two years ago. So it's thanks to what you, 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 you are doing that, uh, you, you know, that I've been aware about blockchain. So that was two years ago. And uh, one of the challenge for us was how can we use that technology so that it's produce value to us? How we can use that with, uh, within our systems to make sure that we are making progress uh, in, uh, and we are more efficient. So what, what was the use case? Uh, we, we started to think about, we have a problem, which is uh, in our uh, you know, organizations, it's not just the same, but everywhere. It's the relationship, all the links that we can have between recordings and works. Uh, you know, a, a song can be uh, performed by many artists, it's always the same works. So you have a lot of recordings, uh, almost 200 million uh, floating somewhere in the web, and uh, you have something like uh, 30 million works that are related to those recordings. And the, the, the vision of all the links uh, that we have today is, uh, is not clear. You know, we don't have or an exhaustive vision of everything. So we started to say, well, 
is blockchain able with uh, this technology of smart contract and decentralized database, is this technology has a potential to help us to improve the quality of all the links that exist between recordings and sound? And we started to work on this specific use case together with ASCAP and PRS. Uh, so our uh, colleagues in uh, England and in uh, US, and start to build a blockchain, putting all our um, uh, links between songs and recordings, and use a smart contract to clean the data, to make sure that you know we have authoritative information. As far as, as, far as we have two of us that got a link, then it becomes uh, something that the, the third one should have. And we use a smart contract to, to, uh, you know, to clean up the data. So, so that at the end, uh, so at this stage, we have been uploading on the blockchain two million uh, works on which we distribute two, money. Two million? Two million works. Mm -hmm. And with all the links that are related with recordings that are related uh, to those works. And we've put that in the blockchain. And we are now in the process using smart contract to clean up those data. And by the end of the year, we will have something up and running. And we will be then decided how we can open it to all the industry because this idea of you know with this is not an information we want to keep for us uh, the idea of those identifiers and all the links uh, uh, is something that we need to to distribute to disseminate as much as possible to all the value chain so that we are collectively uh, more efficient a as a, as an industry and that was really the, the the purpose of this target is of this project was really to see how how we can use effectively blockchain to solve a problem that we were not able to solve with former technology. So I want to quickly turn it over. I want to make sure that Richie and Nacho have the chance to speak. I, I will admit as a moderator, it's a challenge to moderate six people on a panel. I want to make sure everybody has time to talk. Um, well, and you two represent two really critical voices because it's the artistic community. And, and often, unfortunately, um, artists are left out of a lot of these conversations. So, Richie, I'll start with you, um, both from a creative side, but also from a business side. What excites you about this, and are you personally leveraging any of these new technologies? Well, I think we're talking a lot about business already, so I'll focus on creative. Uh, one of the things in the beginning of the presentation earlier was that, you know, what I'm, a lot of the systems that were in place were created because there was a creator and there was a consumer. But the consumer is as much the creator now uh, as the original creator. And as an artist, the worst thing that can happen is if you can't have freedom in your creativity to do what's in your inspiration at that moment. And what I mean by that is with technologies like blockchain, having an information flow of attributes of who created the, 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 the original piece, who are the rights owners, and being able to then create, to remix, to, to uh, mash up, and know that if the correct information is put back into the system, that all the monies will flow efficiently to the original people and to the people who then continue to remix or create down the chain. I think you know technological innovation is one thing, but musical innovation is where there's creative freedom. And that's what this technology can give back to the artist beyond just getting you know, paid. It's like actually having the freedom to follow that inspired moment and knowing that not only that you will be paid, but all the people who came before you who gave you that piece of art that you want to actually re-evaluate will also get paid you know, their dues. Im Imogen Heap wrote a, a really interesting article in actually the Harvard Business Review just four days ago and starts the article by saying that even she, as the creator of a song, didn't have the authority to allow people to take that song and do whatever they want with it, which is a grand irony. One, one of the things I, I, I said earlier in my introduction, you know, we had uh, worked in 2001 on a mix CD, which was 60 minutes, had five or 550 individual pieces of music. And we finally cleared everything, but it took six to eight months, three times the amount of time it took me to create the piece. And even once it was created, we, never, we weren't even sure we were going to get the licenses to actually be able to release it. So that kind of si uh, uh, situation could really 
um, you know, cut off. You know, you, well, actually, after that, we were like, okay, are we really going to spend that much time and resources creatively and economically on my business, having everybody look and call all the different rights management situ uh, companies to actually do that type of project? That type of project, you know, should be able, you know, to be made seamlessly with this type of technology that we're speaking about. Well, and, and you know, creativity is not pre-programmed. You know, you don't have seven months to wait to get clearances for you to want to, to express something. And to Michael's point earlier, it, it's not like the world is made up of a bunch of music thieves. I mean, historically, we have all forms of music are based on something that preceded it. It's just that in the current construct, we're having, we, we have to balance between usage and paying um, uh, a tribute, if you will, or inspiration and remuneration or compensation. Uh, Nacho? I I'm totally agree. Um, uh, uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure that all these kind of technologies are, are uh, going alongside uh, an improvement of creativity. I'm not sure this all, te all these technologies always uh, help to promote uh, diversity as well. So there are two worlds which are the, the projection of the music and the, and the methods to, 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 to create music. music. I don't think uh, all the person are 100% predictable. And that uh, I, it was funny when I heard the Marcos saying that there is an application to just to help you sleep. I'm not sure that there is an application that knows that I want to hear ACDC when I'm sad. Because maybe th the next time I'm sad, I want to hear Mozart, I don't know. But there is something that remains uh, in my brain skeptical about uh, all, these, uh, um, all the effectiveness of, uh, of promoting creativity, diversity. And I'm not 100% sure that all these technologies, in the end, will help to improve our incomes, to our re remuneration as well. So let's cross fingers and think uh, that uh, musicians have always uh, welcomed new technologies, but we cross fingers thinking that uh, in the future we will have a, a better result from uh, our effort and from our work. So you're, you're the skeptic on the panel. Um, so what, what excites you I then? I mean, I so for the first time in 15 years, we're seeing an industry that's beginning to grow again. Yes. What excites you? And I, I, this is a question for, for everybody on the panel. What's exciting about the space that we're in? You know, I, I've been going to these conferences for longer than I remember. And for the last 10 years, it's been, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. Now there's like energy. So what's exciting for you? It's exciting that uh, obviously the, the, uh, the, the market is increasing, which is very good for all of us. But also, not always uh, all, the, all the, the flow of the money is, is uh, the one we, will, we, we would like uh, um, from the, the artist community. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, I have a small story on, on this. And uh, I think, you know, our industry is extremely creative at this moment, uh, leveraging technology. And you know why? It's because we started 20 years ago, you know? Uh, almost 20 years ago, we started to have MP3, and that was a shit show for 10 years. You know, we have been criticized by everybody because we could not enter a, uh, how, we, how we can leverage technology. We were seeing all the threats, not the opportunities, and we have been uh, struggling a lot. Uh, I have been firing a lot of people and artists. So, you know, this, is, this was really a very difficult period, and at that time, you make mistakes you are down you are depressed and you you are seen outside like a, a loser you know so we have been through this and when you think now we are back you know we are back we are, we are back on the scene we are and and we are inspiring the world i can tell you i was uh, uh, sharing this uh, IBM project that we have on big data with machine learning, etc. I was showing it to uh, a big uh, strategist uh, working for uh, 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 cars, softwares, and plane softwares. You know, people that are engineers that are really, for me, the, the guys that you know are supposed to work on technology and. I, I was just explaining to you what we were doing in the music industry and uh, what we were facing today. And, this, and the guy finally looked at me and said me, you know what you are doing is extremely inspiring. You know, uh, um, what you are currently doing uh, is maybe what we're going to have to face in 15 years, you know, with the 3D printers 
uh, you know, and the 3D objects. Uh, uh, maybe tomorrow we will have to do exactly the same uh, things for defending our IPs. Uh, uh, so you are inspiring us. In, you know, big car industry and plane industries are coming to the media and entertainment industry to see how they are coping with the digital challenges, and, I, and we are inspiring them. So this is very positive. And I'm very proud about this because we have been so struggling for years uh, to try to absorb and digest this technology and make it our life every day. And I think this is very encouraging. And, and now show, looking at the market growing up again, this is great, you know, uh, lots of opportunities and not so much threat. Uh, <coughs> I feel also that we are now uh, in a state that we th th technology actually enables us to change the way we have been working for decades. Uh, at Telstra, we kind of identified that uh, one problem in, in the way that CMOs are working is the r reciprocal agreements and the way we distribute money between organizations, and that can take a lot of time and a lot of resources, and we should change that, and that's something, something we've been working on uh, in our blockchain project. We are building a solution for uh, inter-organizational royalty processing and basically we offer tools for data tracking and uh, data exchange and royalty payments for CMOs uh, in the first place but also uh, the PGN platform has a built-in uh, ledger for managing the balance with the payments between the societies and uh, functionality for payment netting and uh, what the hell, it could even be a virtual currency in itself in the future. Uh, in the future, we will be offering APIs for users to join, join the platform and also a web-based system. But at the, at the moment, we are, of course, uh, still in the prototype phase. So we have now a working prototype uh, specially focused on one specific area, which is live music performances. But in the further development stages, we are able to uh, cover basically all of the uh, royalty processing areas online and broadcast, whatever. But I'm really ex excited about that. And um, we have a highly skilled team. Almost everyone is here in this audience. And please come talk to us if you are interested to hear more. Um, I want to quickly come to, to Richie, um, uh, as, as a creator, um, what are things that you see out there that you think, wow, you know, the, these are really fueling me? We talked a bit about blockchain. I was having a discussion with Christoph during the break about AI, and I said to him, you know, yesterday we were talking about the DX7, the Yamaha DX7. I said, I don't know if AI is necessarily going to ever completely replace humans as an expressive medium, but I certainly see it as uh, DX7 on you know, multiple steroids in terms of like unleashing human potential. How, how do you see this stuff? Yeah, I think you know, as an artist, if you feel that the systems in place can track your creative work, then you're gonna have, you're gonna be more open to, to giving more freedom to everybody else out there, how they're going to consume it, how they're going to, you know, you know, whatever they're going to do with it. You know, first you put out a piece of music, and it was a stereo file, and everybody was happy with that. You knew you were going to mostly get paid for that. Now we're to a point where, well, what happens if we release the stems? You know, let's release the actual source material of that. I have many artist friends who don't want to do that yet because they don't understand how they're going to get paid for that. The song by itself, no problem. But the components, that's their creativity. That's also their, you know, that's their, you know, their what's the word? Their, um, you know, their livelihood. But if we can not only have information flow from the song level, but to the stem level, to the component level, you know, so that if one of my affected hi-hats or snares from a popular song. If people, someone's like, hey, I, I love that. I want to use that piece and then rework that as a component into my piece of music. I want to see that happen. I want to be happy to just say, go for that. But you want to make sure that there is a pipeline that 
travels back and gets back to me or to the person I sampled or you know uh, uh, used in, in 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 my original work. So, you know that that's it. There's so many people scared because you know. As a musician, you want to be able to sit in your studio and just work on cool musical ideas, not get another job, you know, sustain yourself from making music, and know that you're going to be paid fairly. And the more you have, uh, you know, you believe that that system is working fairly, the more open you are to sharing the music on a deeper level. And that deeper level will be much more of a creative nearly collaboration, you know, collaborating with people you don't even know, you've never even met, you don't even know you, they've used your, your sample or used your hi-hat and then suddenly that comes up on your dashboard. It should be in real time also, hey, someone in Venezuela is right now working on a song with your hi-hat. You should actually even be able to listen into that too and make contact and further the collaboration, further the communication. So it's almost, I mean, as you were talking, I'm thinking, as music has become digits, um, to some degree, musical creativity is becoming a lot more akin to software development in the sense that you're talking about almost open source innovation. Some rules are governing, are governing this collaboration, but on the other hand, we've seen the massive advancements we've made on a technological standpoint because of open source technologies and where everybody's able to build on top of, on top of somebody else's um, expression. Yeah, I think open source or transparency, putting something out into the ecosystem, which you know you have no control of, where it's going to be shared or where it's going to be consumed, but knowing that you can ad put ad attributes or information in there on how that piece of media can be used gives a whole lot of, of value and, and incentive for artistic freedom and collaboration. Um, Peter and Jacque. I just want to echo what you're saying because that was my answer to what's exciting about this is stems and the role or the, the, the connecting ability between uh, artists and consumers to be able to take that. And whether it's a consumer that's just playing uh, using a remix app on their phone or they're, they're actually an experienced DJ producer, um, we're going to see all kinds of innovative stuff happen in the next uh, few years and it, it will require blockchain because as you talked about the six billion line items that you're processing as one collection society from one country um sorry sorry 100 for 100 countries so it's a hundred it's six billion transactions for 100 countries and next year is going to be 12 billion <laughs> and next year is 12 billion just start imagine stems where you've got a, an electronic track or anything else that's got 20 different tracks and, and maybe 150 stem individual units in a song and you start to open that up. You, you can't do this without blockchain and, and machine learning. It, it'll be impossible, but that, that's what's gonna enable that kind of freedom that you're talking about that the artists are craving for is that desire to just sit at your workstation Go into your stems, put your blockchain user ID in, the, in each line of the stems, click upload, it goes up there, and you've set your terms, and then it just floats. It's just fluid, it's water at that point. That's what's coming, that's where this thing's gonna go. Well, I think it's also flexibility and freedom, not only for the artist, but for the consumer. You know, it's, if I make a, a song which I envision, okay, this is, you know, heavy kick, late night, 3 a.m. in a Berlin nightclub, and that's my favorite song at that moment. But then I'm driving in my car later on in the day, or I'm at home just before I'm going to sleep, and I actually think, oh, well, I'd love to hear that song, but you know, take out the kick, lower the bass line, and I've got that version that I didn't create that version, but I put the components out there and said that, well, people have the freedom to manipulate that in any way because they have access to the stems. And if you start talking about virtual reality experiences where it's a personal interaction with that 3D world, music becomes a very important component of that. How you're turning your head, when you're going, how far you're away from an object. You need music that actually can be generative and not generative from a point that it's brand new machine generative, but generative based upon the components or stems on something that I've created or another artist has created, but it's given the permission to let that song have flexibility and freedom to different listening 
ex or experience situations. Um, Jack, in terms of, well, I want you to comment, and also in terms of, this adds even more pressure on companies like you guys, I'll, I'll, I'll insert the word opportunity, to create new tracking abilities to figure all this stuff out. Totally. So going, going back to the previous question on what do we get excited about? I mean, most of myself and most of us at BMAT are engineers, so we get pretty excited almost with anything, with the sunrise. <laughs> Especially when you have new technologies coming out, like blockchain, that are proposing disruptive and innovat innovative solutions. Uh, we get pretty excited as well. And going back to, to what Richie and, and Peter were mentioning, um, I was explaining before how for us, or for the industry, it's been a challenge no? to jump from four broadcast radio stations that were, able, that were possible to be monitored manually by a uh, few dozen of students, no? uh, to fingerprinting technologies or to metadata uh, matching technologies to be able to cope with these over six billion lines per year that are happening in the digital ecosystem. Um, and we've seen over the last five to 10 years, a number of initiatives that have, have been trying to, to solve or to create, especially with what is related to, meta, to, to ownership, to metadata ownership, no? uh, to, to be able to clear out who is the owner of what uh, in order for artists, uh, allow, allowing artists that uh, they focus on their creativity and they don't have to be worrying that whether my paycheck is gonna come or not. Uh, so we've seen with a much more or less complex in terms of um, retransmission and creative perspective, we've seen a number of projects uh, come and die. Uh, for example, there was an initiative that was called the GRD, the Global Repertoire Database, which if we compare it block blockchain is probably the complete opposite. It was an initiative to be able to buy a one single centralized database where all right ownership was clear. Um, it failed. So if it failed in a context where retransmission and creation was done on a song basis. Uh, it's still a lot of data, it's six billion lines, but we, are not, we were not even talking about stem ownership or who owns this baseline. We were talking about who owns this song or who owns the underlying work that the, uh, that, that song is related to. And in those scenarios, um, the music industry is still struggling. So if we have to cope now with uh, new ways of creating music and collaborating such as stems or uh, virtual reality. Like definitely, like blockchain is something that excites us and we see that as an opportunity to be able to cope, um, uh, to be able to monitor and to uh, distribute, uh, the, to track the transactions and to distribute the royalties that are happening like uh, it's Peter is doing with his streaming service. No? Well, and, and you know, that's our view that if we establish a baseline of a shared digital infrastructure of open standards, which is the attempt of the initiative, then you enable innovation to be built on top of it and thrive. I mean, many people forget because um, a, lot, a lot of folks in the audience are not old enough, but interoperability across the web didn't exist in the 90s. You know, so if you wanted to stream music, depending on your device, depending on the browser, depending on where you were pulling that, that music from, you couldn't access it from everywhere, which is crazy. In the late, uh, in the early 20th century, most buildings in New York had over 20 or 30 different telephone company cables because there was no interoperability among telephone providers. So I used to, you know, I couldn't make a phone call from me to you unless we were both on the exact same phone line, right? So open standards, shared protocols, create um, environments for, for innovation. Um, I want to make sure that we have some time for questions because we have about 10 minutes. Um, so uh, if anybody has questions, I'd like to open it up. Um, I don't know if anybody has a microphone. Hi there. So, uh, yeah, I think the most interesting thing is about the, the stems and like getting other people to work and build upon what you've achieved. So, but my qu question is concretely like, is there an idea how, who is going to get what share of the outcome of the revenue of that, so to say, resulting work of somebody else's input? Like, is that gonna be fixed by law or 
Have you guys uh, had any thoughts about that? Like that, that's a great question. So I'm curious to hear from the two of you that are on the artist side. How do you think something like that should be structured? Yeah, I think you know that's going to have to be somehow tied to the amount of information that you're allowing to be released or you know connected to that song. So if you're looking at eight stems or you're letting down to component levels. It's going to have to be, you know, some kind of percentage based upon the uh, the 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 amount of music that creates the whole. What I mean by that is, like, you know, uh, if if I'm making a song myself and and it's m minimal techno and I've got eight different channels, maybe that's you know would be shared differently than a rock song or you know a more contemporary song with, you know eight musicians and an orchestra on it. So I think that's going to be on a on a case to case basis and something that would uh you know uh, would be hard to decipher to make it equal over all genres and all types of music. And and my personal view is that you should let the market ultimately decide rather than have some sort of legislation that mandates this. I don't know, Nacho, do you have any uh, any quick thoughts no, on this? Actually, I would really like to know how the politicians, the policymakers, are uh, going to be involved in this, uh, uh, in the development of these new technologies? Are they going to take f for them and then use uh, against the industry, uh, or maybe they're going to help the creators? Uh, you better know. You, you, you will tell me. You, you know, I, I think uh, all this transformation is also um, uh, we have to be. Uh, um, Concentrated also in uh, author rights and uh, and uh, making sure that because behind the scene there are always people who are making money uh, so and uh, and we have to defend our rights. Uh, just a quick example: we made a study uh, two years ago on on, f on uh, one big uh, uh, social network. I, I won't give the name. It's a big one. And uh, we have been uh, seeing that in Europe, they were, uh, their sales revenue were 3 billion euro, 3 billion euro of sales revenue. While YouTube, just to, to give an example, you know, a comparison, was only 800 million. So, you know, 3 billion Facebook. Uh, sorry, I, I gave the name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but it's public. You know, it has been released. So, the billion, biggest network. 3 billion. <laughs> And uh, 800 uh, million for, uh, for YouTube. Um, so we have agreement with YouTube and uh, collective management organization. Are that this is part of what they do. You know, it's defending the rights. And uh, when you look at uh, Facebook, we have made also a usage study showing that 50% of what the people were doing when they were at in Facebook was sharing a cultural content. So you have a business where you have 3 billion uh, sales revenue in Europe. Uh, and 50% of what the people are doing is uh, enjoying uh, cultural content. Uh, remuneration for culture, zero. Okay, so that's also why c collective organizations are here to make sure that at the digital age uh, there is a fair, uh, uh, you know, um, um, share of the value. Well, and I think to your point, um, you know, if if you look at the five most valuable companies at least listed on the United States Stock Exchange, they are Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft. On any given day, I mean, these, which are almost all, quote, data companies, are more valuable than any oil company out there. Um, none of these companies produces necessarily original content. Amazon is kind of beginning to get into it, but not really, right? So I think my, this is a, a personal opinion rather than uh, a Berkeley opinion or an initiative opinion, but the pendulum has swung way too much to the distributors of content and away from creators in terms of the value compensation. I think that where we can start is if you can track the content that's being consumed, then at least you have a baseline for how to um, uh, split up compensation. And, you know, if we think that it's complicated, look at technology like Google AdWords, right? I mean, you're able to track down to the, uh, a fraction of a penny when an ad is clicked and who should get paid what. So 
Um, when people ask me, are people gonna, uh, all of a sudden going to be paying more money for music? I don't think that's necessarily the answer. It's more about clearly trillions of dollars of value are accumulated because of the collective attention that music demands. Why not have more of that be able to be tracked and, and driven back to, back to the creators? Yeah. Uh, but sorry, not, Richie, not, and then Marco not, has a question. Not, uh, not only on a you know on a, a financial level of your song has been played or used, but also the information that is also attributed to who's played it, when they played it. That 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 information is valuable for the artist, and also not one month later, two months later. Like I want to know who's playing my song right now. If I know that a whole bunch of DJs, you know, are are, are playing one of my songs in Bogota right now. Well, maybe Bogota is somewhere I should be, you know, traveling to for my next gig. Maybe that's actually one of the, the would be where I would be paid the most for, you know, because everybody seems to like it there. But that information uh, historically has come way too late to be able to make that choice. Because right now, you probably have almost no information about your listeners on Spotify or Deezer or any of these of these platforms. Yeah, a lot of that information is locked away and more of that information flow needs to, to come directly in real time to the, the to the creators. Marco, and then one more question, then unfortunately we have to uh, finish. Good question to uh, Christophe and Turo, thank you for your comments. Uh, you are, in a way, shining lights in being early on these technologies and open music initiative as collection societies. Uh, can you say anything about why potentially your colleagues in other countries have not been so quick to embrace? Hmm. Um, I think it's also, uh, it's just a question of, you know, it, it is very difficult to do everything at the same time. You know, we have to deal with a, a big business. We have 1,500 uh, people in our organization. We have s so many things to do in one day. And of course, when you have a weak signal for an innovation, there is something al always some time that you, you make uh, arbitration between what you have to do in a day and of course what is not, and you are focusing on your daily uh, uh, objectives and not so much in what is going to be your future, which is a mistake. But, you know, uh, it's always very difficult to dedicate a portion of your time thinking about the future. And I, I, you know, it has been really a struggle for us to be able to dedicate some time to focus on delivering something on blockchain. It took us two years uh, with our, in our garage with uh, two or three person, uh, just uh, f dedicated a bit of time with passion on something that they think there might be something interesting here. So, you know, it's a bit of passion. And maybe some others are not yet completely passionate about this, uh, but it will come for sure. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of <laughs> difference with the level of knowledge between CMOs when we are talking about, for example, blockchain and also traditionally societies like us, they are not used to work with tech companies. They see them as a threat. Uh, I would say that we should feel totally opposite because we, we have to have to work with the best players in the world and have to learn from the best players from of the world enable enabling us to stay alive okay last the last question hi um so i have a question about a kind of openness of of the data so um I, i'm work at a metadata company um, called quantome and one of our biggest problems over the past six years has been access to you know the real data the good data we focus more on the other side than this conversation has been about this much more about CMOs and royalty payments we work more on you know, the, the discovery side of stuff so Richie you were talking a lot about um, being able to have the information and pass it on so that other um, prosumers can you know, get at it right away and do something with it and you know all that information is going to be there at every point so what I'm interested in is Looking at adopting blockchain and stuff, do you, do you guys think that the kind of walled garden of people who own the data and have the data and, you know, they ultimately want to keep it because it's essential? And I know that obviously this is what the whole Open Music Initiative is about, but mm -hmm. how do you see these distributed technologies opening up access to third-party companies, data companies, other, other people to take this information and do cool things with it and open the space up further. So I'll quickly answer the question, and then I want to 
see a different people's perspective. So this is why, you know, with open music, with the first um, what we call minimal viable interoperability or the API, we're not mandating blockchain because every different company has it, it, a different timing with respect to adapting new technologies. But we believe that creating the conditions for being able to access the data without everybody having to necessarily offer their own, all of their proprietary data to an open environment is critical, which is what these APIs uh, accomplish. So our view is that through this API ecosystem, if a company like yours or a company like BMAT which is innovating on top of that layer, wants to access information that ultimately ought to be shared by everybody because it enables an ecosystem to exist. Our view is that that should happen, right? So across many industries, you have this sharing of data. Maybe uh, the airline industry is one of them, right? I mean, whether it's flight paths or whether it's actually your ability to access the um, in from, you know, you can access different applications in terms of like buying tickets or whatever. The entire airline business operates off of two databases, <laughs> right? It's because there's openness to that. So our view is that as the industry is evolving, modern companies like Deosto and Sasem are moving away from the concept that the only value they bring is just keeping the data. But ultimately, their, their view is that it's, it's about servicing their members in the best way. And that's certainly not by keeping the data, but by participating in a, an ecosystem and innovating on top of it. Um, but um, I don't know, Peter and uh, uh, Jacque. Uh, oh, there's. I think that we're going to see uh, a lot of chaos the next few years and that we're, there's there's a lot of stuff going on that hasn't even been announced yet that's taking both a bottom up and a top down approach and i think that what we'll what we'll find is that it's a combination of innovative technology and innov innovative business models that is going to lead that and that um, other organizations are going to sort of have to catch up later Jacqueline. So it's also related to Marco's question, actually. On I think both questions are way related on uh, why, with few exceptions like Sassam and Teosto, collective management organizations are not really taking part on these kind of initiatives. I would say one is fear, and it's fear of technology, and it's fear of losing ownership. Um, same way as Napster came 20 years ago, no? like we thought, oh, peer-to-peer -peer is going to kill our business. Well, Spotify has been using peer-to-peer -peer technologies to support the technology for a long time. Um, so I think it can happen the same with, with blockchain. It can happen exactly the same. Uh, from our perspective, um, in terms of data ownership, we don't want to own any metadata. Um, the, the mere fact of owning metadata, I think, is just uh, stupid, if it's allowed to say. The way we see it is like a, a, a fist full of sand. Um, you're holding it today, but it's leaking everywhere. And if you don't have it in two years, everybody's going to have it. So. The way we see it is like we are keen on using these kind of technologies to allow us to have access to good data. Uh, as I was saying before, because of the monitoring we are doing, there are a lot of people that they are using our data in order to pay royalties. Um, it's not our data. It's not uh, data that we are responsible for keeping, but we feel responsible of bringing the tools that allow the st different stakeholders to input their correct data so that, that people can benefit. Mm -hmm. Any quick thoughts, and then we should wrap up from uh, you too, since uh, you, you're much more liberal in your approach with respect to, uh, to data. What's motivating you for that? Uh, I think we should be able to offer more data for third parties. And I see there are, there are also business possibilities for Telstoy in that kind of uh, open data actions. But of course, we have to think, think about uh, security and privacy issues. And of course, there, are, there is some, some data we, we are not able to give out anywhere because of our licensing agreements and stuff like that. So it's not so uh, simple always. I think the, the principle, the center of our motivation is bringing more value, more services to our member. You know, it's, that's the key for us. And of course, then, of course, data for us is, is a weapon to make sure that author rights is properly defended. Uh, so because it's also a war. Uh, so we have to be there. And data is, is a good weapon for uh, defending author rights. Okay, well... Uh
thank you, everyone. And if you have any more questions, you can feel free to talk to us after the panel. But we really appreciate it.